Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to Virtual Cambridge. Um, my name is Stanley Bill. I'm the director of the Polish Studies program here in Cambridge, uh, and I'm delighted to host this event today, uh, which is co-organized by the Center for Geopolitics at Cambridge, the Lithuanian Culture Institute, the Lithuanian Embassy in the UK, the Polish Institute in London, Cambridge Polish Studies and the Institute for Literary, Cultural and Translation Studies at Vilnius University. We have guests in Vilnius, in California, in uh, Chicago, and of course uh, here in Cambridge. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the Polish-Lithuanian writer Czesław Miłosz and the cultural politics and geopolitics of the borderlands. So just to give you a brief sense of uh, the itinerary for this event, we're going to start with a uh, presentation from Tomasz Venslova, who I will introduce in a moment uh, for around 10 or 15 minutes. And then we will have a conversation with Claire Kavanagh and Robert Fagan, and also with uh, Tomasz Venslova. Uh, and then I will lead that conversation. And then at the end of the event, uh, we will give an opportunity for all of you in the audience to ask uh, your own questions and we'll uh, open uh, the conversation up more broadly. So I want to begin uh, by introducing uh, our guests today. Uh, first of all, uh, Tomas Venslova, uh, who is a, a giant of world literature, quite simply. He's a Lithuanian poet, a prose writer, a scholar, a translator of literature. Uh, in 1977, following uh, his dissident activities, he was forced to emigrate from the Soviet Union. And from 1980, he then taught Russian and Polish literature at Yale University. He's won multiple awards, including the Prize of Two Nations, which he received with Czesław Miłosz. He conducted a dialogue with Czesław Miłosz over many years over the identity of the borderlands and particularly over the city of Vilnius, the capital of today's Lithuania, that was so dear to Miłosz. Um, he has honorary doctorates from a whole host of universities in different countries. He's an international member of the Polish Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, and he's also been awarded the Petraka Price Prize for Literature and Translation and the Vilenica International Literature Award. We'll be hearing from Tomas in a moment, but I want to introduce our other two guests. Uh, Claire Kavanagh is joining us from uh, Chicago or Evanston in the United States. She is the Francis Hooper Professor of Arts and Humanities and Professor of Slavic Literatures and Comparative Literary Studies at Northwestern University. Uh, her book, Lyric Poetry and Modern Politics, Russia, Poland and the West, uh, received the National Book Critics Circles Award in Criticism for 2010. She has also received wide recognition, including the 2018 American Academy of Arts and Letters Award in Literature for her many volumes of translations of Polish poetry, including notably the work of Nobel Prize winner Wisława Szymborska, Adam Zagajewski and Ryszard Krenicki. Um, she is now working on an authorized biography of Czesław Miłosz, uh, which is under contract with Farah Strauss and Giroux. Uh, our final guest is Robert Fagan, who is uh, a Barton Evans and H. Andrea Neves Professor of Literature at Claremont McKenna College in California. In 2009, he helped to found a nonprofit uh, Czesław Miłosz Institute and Archive there. Uh, encouraging and benefiting the study of Miwash and Polish culture. Uh, he has won uh, a range of prestigious awards, including the 2011 Guggenheim Fellowship. He has been a Graves Fellow of the National Endowment for Humanities. He's a contributing editor of the Paris Review, has published articles in the Los Angeles Times Book Review and various other outlets. He has composed critically acclaimed editions also of works by Czesław Miłosz and Robert Frost. So thank you very much to the three guests uh, for joining us today. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first speaker of today, Tomasz Venslova from Lithuania, from Vilnius University. Uh, welcome to Virtual Cambridge, Tomasz. Thank you. After Czesław Miłosz's death, there appeared those not numerous but noticeable who started referring to him as a poet, not sufficiently Catholic and not enough Polish. Today, these detractors are even more numerous. There was in this one accusation that was repeated more often than others. Czesław Milos was not at all Polish, he was a Litvin. 
In the old days, it was the name for the people of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And now it is the name for ethnic Lithuanians and citizens of Lithuanian Republic. That is to say, Milos by definition could not have contributed to the formation of Polish culture, but on the contrary, contaminated it with inimical elements. He came from a place which had been related to Poland for several hundred years, but never belonged to it. He was from Lithuania, a country which in the Middle Ages was an independent, half pagan, half Christian empire, and which later on shared the fate of Poland. Lithuania regained independence in the 20th century, at the same time as Poland, although Lithuania was um, part of the Soviet Union and Poland was not, but it's um, it would be sense, uh, yes, senseless to say that it was independent uh, for 50 years. Mm. So we regained our independence at the same time as Poland and twice like Poland in 1918 and then in 1990. The independence of the 20th century turned out to be very different from the old one. It was based on the ethnographic and linguistic factors, which meant that instead of being a powerful medieval state, there appeared a small, albeit ambitious Baltic Republic, like Latvia and Estonia, and in some sense, uh, like Finland. Its capital was Vilnius, or Vilno, or Vilna, or Vilne, a beautiful city, which used to be the center of the empire in the Middle Ages, but had mainly spoken Polish for several centuries and for this reason was annexed to Poland. This resulted in a prolonged and harsh conflict that for many years looked as irresolvable as that over Jerusalem between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Czeslav Milos was above all a poet of Vilnius, which he called a city with no name, this is the title of one of his books, uh, of many names to be precise, since it is uh, called differently in Polish, in Lithuanian, in Russian, and in Yiddish. And besides, in the debates over, over, over Vilnius, uh, Milos took a special position, which caused many Polish Archpatriots to automatically brand Milos suspicious. Nor was it always been clear to Lithuanians who, who this strange Vilnius author really was. Because, because nowadays, uh, Lithuanians are distinguished by their language, a difficult language, completely incomprehensive to a Slav having as little in common with Polish as, for example, Gaelic has in common with English. Milos was used to hearing this language in childhood. He could read it, but never wrote in Lithuanian. But whatever it is, he was born in Lithuania and remained faithful to it. For a Polish poet, this was nothing extraordinary. Adam Mickiewicz, who had a similar place in Polish culture in the 19th century, as Milos had in the 20th, also considered himself to be a Litvin. It was customary for the greatest of Polish writers to trace this, their ancestry from Lithuania, as is the case with the best British writers from Ireland. This parallel has already become commonplace. Any Pole and any Lithuanian knows that Mickiewicz's famed long poem, Pan Tadeusz, begins with the words, Litvo ojczyzno moja, Lithuania my country, Lithuania my fatherland. However, such, such a beginning is all the more paradoxical because the Lithuania of Mickiewicz's Pan Tadeusz is today's Belarus, 
and not Lithuania census stricto. Unlike Mitskevich, Milos came from Lithuania proper, from the very center of today's Lithuanian Republic. Reading Pantadeus in uh, childhood, he was surprised that it mentioned beaches and hunghams, which he never saw in his native region. However, he was a writer of a cultural borderland, just like Mitskevich, and also Paul Salen, Yates, Italo Svevo, or Cavati. Borderland is the kind of soil that engenders conflicts and even wars, including world wars. But it has no doubt many fruits to offer to one's talent. Because of Lithuania's and Poland, uh, Poland's enmity, Miloš's family was forced to move to Vilno, separated at the time from the Kovno Lithuania by a kind of an Iron Curtain among the latter. The temporary headquarters of Lithuanian government was in Kaunas or Kovno, the second largest city of the region. The splendid Baroque capital of the former Lithuanian Empire influenced the development of the poet perhaps to an even greater extent than his native countryside. It kept memory of the theological debates of the 17th century, of the debates between Romanticism and Enlightenment. Here, languages, customs, and eras intersected. In addition to Polish, there were also Lithuanian, Belarusian, Russian, and Jewish communities. As Milos admitted in his poetry, he never managed to walk away from Vilna. Uh, quote, it is a magic, magic city, unquote. He said to his doctor during one of the, of the last weeks of his life. As early as during his years at the gymnasium, he understood the incredible heterogeneity of the, of the city. In one of his later essays, he recalls the strange surnames of his school friends, Alhimovich, Blinstrup, Bobkis, Dabkus, Mirza Murzic, Chebiogli. These, as a rule, were not Polish surnames. They were Belarusian, Lithuanian, quite often Tatar, sometimes German and even Danish. Not Jewish, because Jews usually went to their own schools. The gymnasium was named after Sigismund Augustus, the king of the 16th century, who was a Lithuanian by birth, but no longer knew the language of his ancestors. Nearby, there was another gymnasium named after Vitautas the Great. This elder relative of Sigismund Augustus in turn symbolized Lithuanian separatism and Lithuanians love for the language. That school raised children to serve the Lithuanian Vilnius of the future, which, however, remained but a dream, but came true after World War II. Milos, in his youth, was suggesting a compromise, a Polish-Lithuanian unification, a transition to such a state of affairs when Poland would stop laying its claims on Vilno and stop considering losing the city to be an incurable detriment. And Lithuania would recognize and cherish the Polish and Jewish part of the city's heritage. Also the Belarusian part and even Russian part. One has to keep this in mind, especially in light of the impending threat from Hitler's Germany. The cumulative effect of all these influences was pointed in the same direction. Their lesson was that no form of ethnocentrism, whether Polish or Lithuanian, was admissible. 
that every problem, including the problem of Vilno Vilnius, should be considered from several tantamount perspectives. Years later, thoughts on the fate of Vilnius led Milos to the following concise formulation. Quote, and anyone who wishes the city good has to want it to be a capital, which automatically removes any Polish claims to a Polish Vilno, unquote. In immigration and then in Poland, he managed to find people who shared this thought. First of all, Jerzy Gerdroitz, the editor of the Polish emigre uh, magazine Kultura. In the long run, it was them who offered the solution to the problem of the Lithuanian Jerusalem because they had already beaten the path that the politicians were to take later. No, I may offer you a uh, short personal reminiscence. When um, I first met Czeslav Milos in uh, Berkeley, California, he, um, in uh, conversations with uh, my humble person, he used the, the Lithuanian form Vilnius um, instead of the Polish form uh, Vilno. That was a sort of um, diplomatic politeness. And in and answering him, I always used the Polish form Vilno and not the Lithuanian form Vilnius also as a sign of diplomatic politeness. I think that was a good solution. We uh, continued it throughout Milos's life. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that fascinating uh, introduction to the subject, which I think uh, gives us an insight into this Polish-Lithuanian dialogue, to your personal dialogue with Czesław Miłosz, but also this key historical uh, background that may not be entirely familiar uh, to all of our listeners. So I want to uh, open the conversation up now uh, and start with uh, Claire Kavanagh. Um, and Claire, if Miłosz was a geopolitical thinker, and we're being asked to talk a little bit about geopolitics here, where we're the center for geopolitics, uh, then his ideas were shaped by his own tumultuous experience of the history of his region, partly by his encounters with Marxism at, at an important point in his life, uh, but also by a deep, Polish tradition of historical fatalism with respect to Poland's location on an indefensible plane between uh, the great powers of Germany and Russia. Miłosz himself witnessed events of the Russian Revolution, the Polish-Lithuanian War, the German occupation of Poland, the Soviet takeover of Lithuania, the Holocaust, the beginning of the total destruction of Warsaw, and the post-war imposition of a communist government uh, with which he later cooperated before eventually defecting in France. So how does Miłosz engage in his writing with the fundamental confrontation between what he characterizes as a merciless historical necessity, that's the term that he uses, uh, of these geopolitical processes in his region and the fragile human individual? It's a huge question and First of all, I just want to thank Thomas Vinsilva for th that beautiful, that kind of gem of an introduction to, to Miłosz as a Lithuanian. And that's going to inform my answer, which has shifted while I was listening. Um, I think Miłosz is, is a geopolitical thinker by way of poetry. Uh, to abstract his ideas from the poetry um, is exactly what he resented in being held captive, in a sense, by the captive mind, which was his first book in English and his most famous for many decades. Um, he is uh, a geopolitical thinker through, by way, inflected by Lithuania, I think. You talked about a Polish sense of historical necessity. He had a critical distance on every single identity he partly inhabited. And I think it's one thing he felt at home with later in the United States is the idea of the hyphenate identity. You know, I'm an Irish American, you know, that, that everybody has these multiple inflected identities and that these identities are necessary for negotiating a time of globalizing theories, which is what he experienced in 
both Lithuania and in his childhood. Um, as you mentioned, um, he came into contact with Russia and the revolution very early on. His father was a civil engineer in the Russian Empire because Lithuania was, as Thomas said, part of the Russian Empire at the time. Um, and they got trapped in Russia in the process of becoming Soviet Russia. And his claim was that he learned Russian from revolutionary soldiers who were, I think, in the same rooming house as his family at the time. So he was brought into physical contact with these, these conflicts before he could intellectually possibly have processed them. He was a, what, seven at the time, um, and lived with those conflicts all the way through. His father was trapped on one side. Thomas mentioned that, that after the quote unquote liberation of Poland and Lithuania, at the end of the First World War, um, boundaries were still in dispute constantly throughout that period. And what your country was, um, one of the things I, I use to explain the Polish and the Lithuanian situation to my students, as I say, there are countries where you can go into exile by staying at home. And that is precisely the situation in, in that part of the world, in the borderlands. Uh, his father was stranded on one side of this iron curtain that Thomas mentioned. Um, while he and his family were on the other side, and you had to cross illegally, even in the period of free, liberated, quote unquote, newly independent Poland and Lithuania. So he was raised on all of these conflicts. And what I think is crucial here is he comes of age um, as a, both a poet and a young man in Vilnius at a time when the threats on both sides are absolutely clear and they are totalizing ideologies of very different kinds. One is sort of the fetishization of nation in a, a mythologized version of nation and race, Nazi Germany. And Miłosz was very aware of threads in specifically Polish thought that fed into that and that are still visible, unfortunately, in contemporary Poland of a fetishization of Polishness. Um, and then on the other hand, he felt both the attraction of and the danger of the totalizing ideology of communism, which says that the end, the global end of the world lies in um, class. So you have these two, ultimately, as he presents the mythic visions, totalizing visions, what happens to the particular when you get caught in that world? Well, what I want to give as one example as a way maybe to launch into that is a famous poem from 1980, shortly before he received the Nobel Prize. He revisits Paris. Um, I'm going to echo again something uh, Thomas said. Is something I said he thought, uh, something he, he writes several times that I thought was quite beautiful is that he went into exile the minute he left Vilnius, that even going to Warsaw was a form of exile for him. So he's never quite in any single one identity. But this poem uh, translated in English as bypassing or mistranslating, bypassing Rue Descartes. The Polish is Rue Descartes. The first line is Mijajons Rue Descartes. In, in, for some reason, uh, Renata Gutzinska and Robert Haas decided to translate it, the, the first phrase of the poem, and it should be crossing Rue Descartes which is entirely different. He doesn't evade it, he goes past it. Um, so the idea of Cartesian philosophy is something, a seduction that you go through. Totalizing philosophy is a seduction you go through. And I'm gonna just read a little bit of the poem, if I may, by way of introducing some of the complications that he brings into this discussion of the regional and the global, which again seems extremely au courant today. And in many ways his embrace, as, as Thomas said, of kind of the provincial imagination as key to an understanding of the world is rooted not in his Polishness, but in his Lithuanian Polishness, which he never ceases to investigate throughout his entire life. Um, and I'll, I'll give a few examples from the poems here and we can see how the poems really deal in the most subtle and remarkable way, I think, with issues that as far as I can see could not be more germane today. This is the poem in their translation. Bypassing Rue Descartes, I descended toward the Seine, shy, a traveler. This refers to his own periods in Paris as a young man. A young barbarian, he's on the outside, just come to the capital of the world. And he writes about this in other places of the world, that, that he was looking for the center. 
part of his search is a center, a core ideology. It explains part of his attraction to communism that explains the world. We were many from Yassi and Koloshvar, Vilno and Bucharest, Saigon and Marrakesh. You'll notice there the, the geopolitical spread of colonies, some of which were colonies of, of France. So in fact, he's, he's looking at French colonial history here too. A shame to remember the customs of our homes about which nobody here should ever be told. The clapping for servants, barefooted girls hurry in, dividing food with incantations, choral prayers recited by master and household together. I had left the cloudy provinces behind. I entered the universal, dazzled and desiring. And here's a key passage once we start looking at uh, communist colonization of various nations, which doesn't enter often enough into the modern dialogue. The second world ceased to exist. We have the first and the third, and somehow academia forgot to count correctly. So uh, colonization entering in here and the decline of colonization. Soon enough, many from Yassi and Koloshvar or Saigon or Marrakesh would be killed because they wanted to abolish the customs of their homes. One reference here obviously is to communist ideology in, in Asia as well as Europe um, that did, diminishes heritage and tradition that, that Mule Church. Soon enough, their peers were seizing power in order to kill in the name of the universal beautiful ideas. Meanwhile, the city behaved in accordance with its nature. And what we'll see here is that Paris, as he sees it in 1980, is a bunch of little provinces. There is no big Paris, there are neighborhoods. Um, Meanwhile, the city behaved in accordance with its nature, rustling with throaty laughter in the dark, baking long breads and pouring wine into clay pitchers, buying lemons, fish, lemons and garlic at street markets, indifferent as it was to honor and shame and greatness and glory, because that had already been done and it, it, that had been done already and had transformed itself into monuments representing nobody knows whom. So the Parisians are oblivious to the grand monuments to you know, freedom, e equality, whatever, all of this into arias hardly audible and into turns of speech. Um, again, I lean on the rough granite of the embankment as if I had returned from travels through the underworlds and suddenly saw in the light the reeling wheel of the seasons where empires have fallen and those once living are now dead. There is no capital of the world, neither here nor anywhere else and the abolished customs are restored to their small fame. And now I know that the time of human generations is not like the time of earth. As to my heavy sins, I remember one most vividly, how one day walking on a forest path along a stream, I pushed a rock down on a water snake coiled in the grass. And what I have met with in life was the just punishment which reaches sooner or later, the breaker of a taboo. Now, one thing I want to say here, and maybe I'll just finish up with this, is he does something very interesting here, which is he doesn't, he refuses to absolutely mythologize the provinces too. Um, he says in the beginning of the masters and the servants, the clapping of hands, if you read that back into the Lithuanian past, what that would have been is the servants that he, he remembers so beautifully, Paulina, the serving woman at their house, who are Lithuanian speakers, and there's a master overseeing the servants, and there's a language that they all accord with, and there's a, a choral prayers, food and incantations. So you have a little bit of a hint here of what, what Thomas mentioned, the pagan and the Christian converging. So he's hinting at the complications of the provincial past. Um, and at the same time, the killing of the water snake he identifies it as a Lithuanian pagan superstition. So it's not adhering to the, the um, Christian traditions of Poland and Lithuania, and in, at the very least, it's complicating them. But the original sin is that you leave the province. And how do you ever know what the province was only by having left it? So it's got kind of the uh, Christian teleology going in here too, but it deals with the idea of universal and province, but the province is a complicated place with its own forms. It's implied or suggested of colonization. Um, and that kind of negotiation between Poles as conquerors, Poles as colonizers, 
It's one of the reasons that, as Thomas said, uh, his Lithuanianness was so much held against him. I talked about this once in Krakow a number of years ago, and not one of the people in the audience, but one of the, the women doing the work in the hall, you know, doing all the logistical stuff came up to me afterwards and said, why didn't he just go back to Lithuania? Please. Um, but that why he he's such anathema to the Poles is because he's saying your own heritage, it, you talk about historical determinism, well, you fought to maintain your own colonies or to maintain you know, your own um, subordinates. Um, so he's constantly complicating these relationships and that's precisely because I think of this hyphenate complicated identity of being a Polish Lithuanian. Thank you very much, Claire, for, and thank you for bringing the poetry into this discussion and integrating it so beautifully with the, with the political and geopolitical uh, questions. Um, I want to turn now to, to Bob, and please feel very free also to, to uh, respond to what Thomas and, and Claire have said. Uh, but I, I want to start with a question about Miwash's most political book, and as Claire said, the one that is probably still most famous in that in many ways he was trying to escape, uh, which is The Captive Mind first published in 1953, after his defection from the diplomatic service of the Polish People's Republic. Um, what, what is the significance of the book today, do you think? Um, it still comes up regularly in contemporary discussions, especially in the United States, uh, for example, in reflections on the subject of contemporary authoritarianisms and threats to democracy. Um, what lessons does the book still hold? Thank you. Thank you. I'm, it's, I'm delighted to be with you this morning or this evening. Sorry, it's this morning here <laughs> where I am in Los Angeles. Um, uh, it, it is, of course, uh, ironic that um, the captive mind with its title was a, a kind of captivity that, that Miłosz wanted to escape uh, throughout, his, uh, uh, throughout his life. He didn't want to be bound by that book. Um, I once asked him, uh, why did you write The Captive Mind? And he said very bluntly, because I was stupid. Um, now, uh, of course, we know that, that, that Miłosz was relentlessly uh, self-critical. And uh, uh, I, I don't really think that he felt he was stupid, but um, uh, I'm sure that the book caused him um, a great deal of, of grief. Um, uh, in a number of in a number of ways, um, I'm fascinated by the book in terms of how it um, continues to be a model for the seductions of totalitarianism um, and the, uh, the the seductions really of any kind of totalizing ideology. Uh, and and I think that that is the um, the lasting uh, impact of the book is not only um, in its historical setting as a, as a critique of um, uh, those who would uh, follow what he can call the method or uh, dialectical materialism um, and communism, uh, but uh, uh, really the formation of, of uh, any kind of ideology that, that, that takes over one's essential being. There's a passage um, in the captive mind uh, in the chapter, Looking to the West, in which he writes, um, all concepts men live by are a product of the historic formation in which they find themselves. Fluidity and constant change are the characteristics of phenomena. And man is so plastic a being that one can even conceive of the day when a thoroughly self-respecting citizen will crawl about on all fours, sporting a tail of brightly colored feathers as a sign of conformity to the order he lives in. And then he goes on to say something about the East and America. The man of the East cannot take Americans seriously because they have never undergone the experiences that teach men how relative their judgments and thinking habits are. So from a very early age, um, I think Milos, Milos was acutely aware of um, the uh, relativity of his own world perspective and his judgments. And that, that certainly was uh, a result of his growing up 
uh, as he did in this borderland. Um, and also uh, going through um, uh, many conflicts that uh, impinged upon uh, a sense of not only national identity, but also of uh, worldview. Uh, uh, Miłosz had a, a, a magical sense of the natural world at a very early age that was in many ways um, corrupted or um, uh, disturbed by um, uh, both uh, uh, his studies in uh, theology and also his studies early on in science. Uh, that, that is, he becomes a kind of exile from uh, the, the world of, of magical presence, an important word for him. Um, but uh, I see the captive mind as reflecting um, a kind of psychological politics. Um, there is a poem that he wrote in English. Uh, as far as I know, it's the only poem he wrote in English. Uh, to Raja Rao, uh, who was um, uh, uh, Indian, but was living in, I believe, Texas when uh, uh, Miwash met him. Uh, and I gather also that uh, Raja Rao had, uh, had been trained in, in uh, a Catholic theology. Um, Miwash had some kind of debate with him. Uh, and it resulted in, in what I think is really an extraordinary poem um, in, in which Miro says, I am the, uh, the monsters that visit my dreams and reveal to me my hidden essence. And I find that when reading Miwash, uh, many of his poems are odes to people uh, that he has great conflicts with. So for example, uh, the, the heart of the captive mind are, are these portraits of people with whom he uh, has, uh, uh, you know, I think more than just a simple critical relationship, a very ambivalent relationship. Uh, uh, this is particularly true in the case of uh, Alpha Andrzejewski, uh, that uh, uh, they obviously were, were very close, uh, but, but uh, Miłosz ultimately winds up being, you know, extraordinarily critical of him. Uh, this is the, these people, people uh, that he encounters in different cultures become the, the kind of monsters of his dreams that he, it, through his poetry, he is um, uh, trying to, uh, against whom and in dialogue with, he's trying to define his own essence. And um, I think it's uh, very interesting to me that uh, one of the words that, that Miłosz uses frequently in relation to this is schizophrenia. It's a word he uses in uh, the poem to Raja Rao. He talks about being on the border, of, not even in, in a schizophrenic state, in the border of schizophrenia. Um, so, so the borderland uh, for, for Miłosz becomes very darkly, I think, uh, this state of being possessed by many voices that haunt him. Um, that drive him and that drive him to, in a way, search for a kind of self-definition. Uh, and in, 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 um, in the case of the United States, the case of America, one of the, the uh, famous poetic portraits this, in, in this mode uh, is, is uh, to Robinson Jeffers. Um, so, so that um, uh, he sees Jeffers as like himself, a kind of outsider, um, uh, someone who is living on the borderlands um, and has a great deal of integrity. But nevertheless, uh, Miłosz takes him to task for embracing an ideology that involves uh, mostly Nietzsche and Darwin and assuming that is what is natural. Um, so, so the captive mind is, is in a way a metaphor for um, uh, uh, Miłosz's struggle to find uh, his own hidden essence uh, in dialogue with, with those who have become um, uh, ideologically imprisoned. Uh, but that, 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 that is something that he struggled with, I think, his entire life. Um, and, and in that sense, 
uh, the, the idea of the fall is so important to him because I think that there is a, a, um, a notion of, of being in a state of belief and innocence in a particular way of looking at the world that one is, in, it, uh, is constantly either being uh, dispossessed of or forced out of. Um, and, and then one tries to live with holding both worlds in, in one's consciousness, the world of, of innocence and belief and the world of skepticism and doubt. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously, uh, Miłosz was very attracted. His messianic longings left him very attracted to the same kind of forces that um, he describes affecting the uh, figures in the captive mind, but that ultimately um, he keeps trying to transcend uh, 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 those, those, those forces. Um, so I, I just wanted to say that by way of, of uh, uh, extending um, uh, the discussion. Uh, uh, I, I think also, uh, if you look at his, his wonderful poem, Ars Poetica, um, he, uh, he, he reminds us that, that the, the self is open, uh, that, that the border of the self is not closed, that, that the self is porous, and he sees this as um, a, a crucial factor in, in, in his own consciousness, uh, that, that sense of an open border uh, of, of the self that it, it is um, uh, hopeful that uh, uh, good spirits will, will inhabit it rather than, than, than evil ones. Um, what, one other little anecdote. Um, I think I asked him once, uh, uh, do, do you, uh, speak or, or uh, Lithuanian, and, and uh, uh, Tomas could inform me more of this. He said no, uh, but he said Lithuanian is what they will be speaking in heaven. Uh, so uh, I, I think he had that very strong sense of uh, Lithuania as a, as, as a, as a um, uh, you know, a primordial landscape of, uh, of, of embodied beauty uh, that, uh, that, 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 that he was constantly trying to reach uh, back to uh, uh, in, in all of his uh, continual falls into exile. Thank you very much, Bob. And, and thanks for reminding us of uh, Miwash's point in that poem that the individual self is as heterogeneous as the Polish-Lithuanian borderland. Um, yes. I want to return uh, uh, to Thomas. Um, with uh, a question also starting with the captive mind. I mean, the final chapter of the captive mind is entitled The Lesson of the Baltics. Um, and it describes the takeover of Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia by the Soviet Union as an example of the wider fate of small nations in what Miwash then understands as this inexorable march of, uh, of an imperial history. He even compares the fate of the Baltics with that of the native inhabitants of South America in the 16th century. Um, today's Baltic states remain wary of Russia and Russian power. Uh, so for instance, recently rejecting along with Poland, um, the Merkel Macron plan to hold talks with Vladimir Putin. Um, how do Lithuanians then approach the ongoing challenges to their security as a small nation now in the European Union and NATO, but still located next to a Russian state that annexed territory from Ukrainian neighbors only seven years ago. Um, what is the lesson of the Baltics today? Okay. Well, in the captive mind, uh, Milos speaks about the fate of the Baltic states which is, in his opinion, one of the most serious problems of the modern world, and of Europe in particular. The Baltic states were occupied and annexed by Russia at least twice. First in the 18th century, secondly in 1940, and then reoccupied in 1944. All that happened against the will of majority of the populations and resulted in quite serious damage, primarily moral and psychological one. Because of that negative experience, Lithuanians 
Latvians and Estonians, as well as Poles who underwent a very similar fate, are definitely sensitive to Russia, to Russia's imperial drive or to Russia's revanchist drive today. They may be a bit oversensitive. I personally don't believe in Russia's innate and incurable imperialism. Neither do I believe in Mr. Putin's omnipotence. Putin is not a new Stalin, even if, if, even if one would be happy to see more difference between these two dictators. Still, one must reckon with today's Russia's aggressive behavior and its brazen-faced contempt for human rights. In all that, Putin's Russia is seconded and perhaps even exceeded by Mr. Lukashenko's Belarus. We in the Baltics can only welcome strong and principled Western response to Putin's and Lukashenko's actions and schemes. Well, that, that's all I can tell you concerning the lesson of the Baltics. Thank you very much. Um, if we turn back to uh, Claire um, and back to this question of Polish-Lithuanian identity that, that, that Thomas sketched out so beautifully in the introduction and that you started to talk about as well. Um, so we've heard how uh, Miłosz was born in 1911 in central Lithuania, then the Russian Empire. He went to high school and university in, in Vilnius, um, and he, he often presented himself as a Lithuanian Pole. But what, what did this mean for him? Um, could you say a little more perhaps about the broader basis of this historical identity? There was actually a comment about that that we've already received in the Q&A. And in fact, may I encourage um, uh, audience members to start to put their questions through in the Q&A. Um, so how did Miłosz understand his Polish-Lithuanian borderland identity and perhaps use it strategically almost at times to shape his own self-presentation uh, as a poet um, and, and a writer. And if it, it, we try and probably get through three more responses, but if we make these a little bit shorter um, so that we can then have time at the end uh, for uh, questions, to, to cover those questions from the audience. Well, I, I won't read a whole poem again because the, the answer to that is all hidden in from the rising of the sun, but that's about 40 pages long. <laughs> so, but I, I will make reference to it. I mean, again, Thomas has already set this up as he has the important precursor poet, Adam Mickiewicz, as a, a Polish-Lithuanian who never actually set foot, as people emphasize, in Poland proper, um, who was sent into exile um, in Russia. So he has the precursor. Of course, he was from the, the what is now Belarus. But again, it just points to the sort of fragility and friability of all these borders that, um, again, um, Thomas referred to is that they, they've been separated out linguistically. That didn't used to be the case. And I'll, I'll return to that in, in just a moment because that's something Miłosz activates in his poetry. Um, for him, it's a way of both staking a claim to the great Polish romantic tradition and also challenging it as it's come to be perceived. He calls uh, in, in later years, he calls there's a, a line that wasn't, I think it's from the treatise on theology that wasn't translated where he says that Mickiewicz has been turned into a jar of patriotic preserves for mass consumption. Um, <laughs> and what happens, yeah, I don't know why they cut that from the translation, it's such a good line, but um, the Lithuanian-ness has been edited out in the way that, as I always used to, to illustrate it with my undergraduates who have no idea what any of these places are, um, they read Shankevich is a lighthouse keeper in which he receives his e emergency care package of Polish romantic poetry when he's in danger of becoming happy elsewhere. And he doesn't need to read Pantadeusz. He just opens it at random and the whoosh of Polishness just engulfs him. So the, it's as if the first passage were written out. But what Mickiewicz does and that Miłosz I think continues and expands is to say that Polish identity is composite, it's heterogeneous to, to use what, what um, Bob was talking about. Um, and he even talks about something that gets reactivated again in Miłosz about architecture. He has a beautiful description of the way that 
Jewish architecture is part now of the Lithuanian landscape. There's a character named Buchmann, who's a good Pole, even though his last name is German. And to, in my reading, the, the Jewish character, Jankil, is the romantic hero. He's the one who synthesizes all different bits of identity while remaining himself and does the great improvisation of Polish history at the end. He's the great improviser in the, in the poem. So he's creating a synthetic vision and Miłosz wants his idea of going to the past, which I really value, is that you approach it through philology. And what philology always tells you is that identity is impure and composite. And then he does this more extensively than Mickiewicz ever does. Um, and I, I asked him about this once. Um, but that, because what he does, and it's particularly visible in From the Rising of the Sun, is give place names in multiple languages the way Thomas did where the places he's born, it's in from the rising of the sun, but not only, of course, um, that the places he was born have multiple names. His family has multiple names. If you go back and scratch the 16th century, I believe he said he found these documents in the library at Berkeley. He has extensive commentary and he gives sort of etymol etymological and historical usage of various place names. Um, creating this complicated vision of Polish, even linguistically, uh, the one document where it's a heritage document, the inheritance is got Latin, it's got East Slavic. This is one time I was glad of being forced through um, Old Church Slavonic and medieval Russian in graduate school. I could recognize the East Slavic index. It has Lithuanian forms in it. It has multiple linguistic forms in it. So he never lets you think there is one stable identity and his own family he goes back and says Miłosz originally is um, a South Slavic name um, that his family must at some point have derived from South Slavic. So he's, he's constantly working on complicating religious political, ethnographic, all these layers of identity through um, etymology. And that's something that he retains in, in translation as much as he can, but of course there's only so far you can go. Um, what he's doing there is, an, is a political gesture in and of itself. Um, and in the United States, traditionally, he's thought of as the, the if not the creator, the organizer of, or the, the um, introducer of what he called the Polish school of poetry. Um, in Poland, in some ways, he's the creator of a Lithuanian school of Polish writing because he goes back and traces the Lithuanian roots of someone like Gombrowicz of uh, who else? Thomas could help me out here. I, I, I know a lot of the names because he, he keeps adding to the list of the people, Konwitski follows up on this, other people do that, that their roots lie in this neglected and immensely complicated part of Polish history that involves captors and captives um, imperializing as well as being colonized and infinite linguistic, cultural, religious, historical mix. So that's kind of my answer on that front, such as it is. Thank you very much. Um, I can turn now uh, to Bob and pick up what, what Claire um, touched on, uh, which is this North American context um, Miłosz, of course, did much of his writing about Lithuania from San Francisco, where he was working at University of California, Berkeley, from the early 1960s. And he's often comparing and contrasting the history of his native borderland region uh, with California. He gets very interested in Californian history. Um, so how did exile um, and his American experience during the Cold War um, shape the way Miłosz viewed and depicted the borderland in his writing? So, so how did the United States influence um, his thinking on the identities and, and history of uh, the borderlands. Well, it's a, it's a it's a difficult question um, uh, and an important one. Um, I, I think that um, th there's a, a simultaneous. Um, hmm, how shall I put this? Um, He definitely defines um, himself against an American sense of nature. 
Um, and this is evident um, uh, in uh, not only in, in, in the poem to Jeffers, but in his essays about Jeffers, also his letters to Thomas Merton, um, that th there is a sense that uh, for him, um, uh, the culture of, of uh, Lithuania uh, and, and his, his uh, the, the landscape of his youth um, is is a uh, preserve, as it were. It becomes more intensely a preserve against um, uh, a kind of inhuman sense of nature that he finds prominent in um, uh, in, in in the United States. So, for example, the poem to Robinson Jeffers begins, "If you have not read the Slavic poets, uh, so much the better." there's nothing there for a Scotch Irish wanderer to seek. They lived in a childhood prolonged from age to age. Um, for them, the sun was a farmer's ruddy face. The moon peeped through a cloud and the Milky Way gladdened them like a birch line road. They long for the kingdom, which is always near, always at hand. Then under apple trees, angels in homespun linen will come parting the boughs. Um, uh, so I, I find that in his poetry, uh, Miłosz becomes more intensely interested uh, in this uh, childhood realm uh, as as a as a um, uh, a landscape against the violence uh, that he sees depicted and and almost appreciated in in uh, as an aspect of nature in, in other in other uh, countries, including the United States. Uh, now, of course, there he says the Slavic poets, um, uh, you know, I, I, I sense that the landscape there is Lithuania, even though, um, you know, by Slavic poets, he has a generally broad encompassing sense of what that, uh, that, that refers to. Um, uh, I, I would say that, um, uh, well, I'll just leave it there. I mean, yeah, that, that is a, a mysterious reference uh, there, but I mean, he, he's obviously in part talking about uh, the, 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 the Slavic po poets writing in Slavic languages in this composite region, right, which is uh, at different times the Grand Duchy uh, of Lithuania, but not only. Um, perhaps Thomas can add to that, uh, because I want to turn back to him with a slightly different question, which brings us back to the present a little bit as well. So we've heard, of course, that Miłosz has spent so much of his youth in, in regions that were hotly contested. So Poland took Vilnius and the surrounding areas in a war with Lithuania in 1919 and 1920. Um, this region later became part of the Lithuanian Soviet Socialist Republic um, and then finally of independent Lithuania. So since 1991, there have sometimes been tensions between Poland and Lithuania, um, perhaps especially on the Lithuanian side as a, a smaller nation that has felt historically threatened by Polish uh, political and cultural claims. Um, is this changing now? Um, how, how do Lithuanians view Poland, uh, Poles, including the Polish minority living in Lithuania, um, and their shared history today? The long and dark context for the Vilnius area left its traces in subconscious of both Poland and Lithuania, I would say. Now I believe this is becoming perfectly anachronistic. Still, there are political forces in both countries which welcome revival of Lithuanian and Polish confrontation. And they do their best in inflating negative memories of the interwar period, etc. There are certain violations of ethnic rights in Vilnius region. For example, the ban of Polish letters in the documents. W um, is forbidden, for example, since only V exists in Lithuanian spelling. Uh, there is also the ban of bilingual place names, even in the territories where Polish speakers are prevalent. Some violations obtain also in Seine region now belonging to Poland. But in my opinion, we should speak primarily about our own errors 
and not the errors of the opponent if we want to de-escalate the conflict. This feeling of the continuing Polish threat is patently absurd, helpful only to Mr. Putin and his geopolitical advisors. Then heavens, it seems to become marginal. Milos Gas contributed much to the changing of the Lithuanian attitude, and I think he still contributes to it. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, an issue that in, in Poland has become uh, in some ways less salient politically. We hear less tension about Lithuania uh, than about Ukraine, for instance, uh, from, from nationalist voices uh, in Poland. The main issue of contention is often the question of the uh, Polish minority um, in Lithuania. Uh, but there, there seems to be a, a kind of increasing uh, interest in the shared history uh, of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, for example, and, and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, um, which is a uh, perhaps an encouraging sign for relations between the two countries. So I want to turn over, we have a little bit of time left, we've still got plenty of attendees in presence uh, who are present um, uh, to uh, questions uh, from the audience. Um, and the first one, uh, perhaps I could uh, direct to Claire, um, and this is from an, an audience member who's, who asks, um, is it not a big geopolitical problem for the individual to come from one country and feel allegiance to it, but write in another language, um, since so much of our thought is formed by our language? So I suppose it's a question about the, the, the sort of tensions inherent in that in that Lithuanian identity and the fact that you know he didn't really speak the language and there's a and there's a um, uh, there's a degree to which there's a limit to how far he can extend the notion of his Lithuanian identity. But that's something perhaps Claire could start on and then perhaps Thomas, you could uh, jump in because you obviously had these conversations um, uh, at, at length uh, with, with Miłosz. Well, it's something that, that Miłosz himself addresses at multiple points is what does it mean to be a Lithuanian poet writing in Polish as he sometimes defined himself. Um, and Thomas brought up an analogy that me, I, I think it's one, in one of the conversations with Thomas and me about the, the Anglo-Irish tradition of writing. What does it mean for Yeats to be an Irish poet, a Protestant Irish poet from the old English ascendancy um, in Ireland, writing in English, celebrating the creation of a new Ireland. He was part of the, the Young Ireland movement in the 1890s, which parallels in some ways the Posca. Um, and it's a, it's a struggle that Yeats never completely is at rest with. And then on the other hand, if you take someone like Seamus Heaney, who was um, Northern Irish, left for Southern Ireland, which was perceived as a betrayal by many people for the Republic of Ireland, wrote in English, but with a decided Irish accent that sometimes you can't even tell what the rhyme word is because you don't know how to pronounce the Gaelic place name. You know, you, you, you have to figure out the rhyme from the English. Um, I think one thing is that Poles were writing in these various forms of Polish. As I mentioned, Miłosz quotes documents, early modern documents in which the language is hybrid in Polish, that Polish is part of the Lithuanian past for better and for worse. And that writing in Polish from Lithuania is in fact a tradition, um, witness Mickiewicz among others. Um, but I think what he does by including the multiple place names, I hadn't realized those were prohibited now in Lithuania, which is very interesting, the, the place names and how they get anglicized or Polonized or whatever is, is an acute political issue even here in the United States. Um, I'll just give one brief example. In, in, in Los Angeles, I'm, I'm a native Californian. I grew up on the other side of the bay from Miłosz. Um, but in Los Angeles now, what used to be Los Feliz is now Los Feliz. I think they've changed the pronunciation. They're trying to make it respect, uh, uh, adhere to Spanish pronunciation rather than all these anglicized versions. Um, so hybrid writing in a way, I think one thing Miłosz might argue is writing. Again, he argues against linguistic purity. One of the reasons he makes this turn um, in the post-war years, particularly to American as opposed to 
either British poetry or French poetry, which he was sort of educated on, raised on, is he says it's an impure language. It's a hybrid polyglot language. And in that way, it's like Polish. It's not like the Académie Française where everybody monitors what gets in and what's left out. So linguistic impurity is the only way to be faithful to history. Um, I think that would be his argument there is the idea, the myth of a pure language, a pure national identity. We've seen how that gets acted out in 20th century history in the form of Nazism and, and various fascist movements across Europe and not just across Europe. We had them in the States as well and still have them. Ethnic purity, all of these things are dangerous myths. And one way is to embrace impurity by way of your language as a writer. Thomas, uh, would, would you like to, uh, to, to add to that? Not necessarily. <laughs> Are, are you able to answer another question which has come through, which is asking um, how different, the, the specific question is how different are the histories taught to children in Polish and Lithuanian schools nowadays? Now, I appreciate you may not have a direct answer, you may not be fully familiar with the education systems of both of those countries and be able to answer that question specifically, but you may be able to say something about the different visions of that shared histories of that shared history uh, as you as you see it in conversations with Poles and Lithuanians about this shared, uh, about this shared past? Well, uh, speaking about history, well, unfortunately, in Eastern Europe, uh, we have a rule that, um, for example, Lithuanian textbooks are written um, using uh, two axioms. The first axiom is Lithuanians are always right. The second axiom is if Lithuanians are wrong, see the axiom number one. <laughs> so um, I believe the Polish textbooks, especially uh, in the latest period, uh, in, well, uh, they, are, they are looking similarly. They're looking similarly. I um, made uh, an effort and wrote uh, um, two volume uh, Lithuanian history for everybody. Um, well, it is of course competitive, it is very popular, but it tries to uh, go beyond those uh, two, yes, two axioms. Uh, it tries to take into um, account the, the different uh, point of view, the point of view of an other, including Poles, including Jews, including uh, many other inhabitants of Lithuania. This is uh, the difference between uh, ethnic uh, consciousness and uh, civic consciousness. And I, I think that the most important things, thing for today's Eastern Europe is to uh, go from the strictly ethnic consciousness to the civic consciousness of, or, yeah, yes, of the classical Western kind. Thank you very much. And th th there is some sense of trying to draw on the shared heritage of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the, the, the civic traditions, civic traditions that were limited to a small proportion of the population, i.e. the, the gentry, um, the so-called schlachta in Polish, um, that, that, that the democratic, sort of nascent or proto-democratic traditions for that, at least that group that existed in that polity. And therefore, I think it's interesting to add a comment that one of our audience members has uh, added people here um, uh, has added here, which is to say that uh, just today, uh, the ministers of foreign affairs of Poland, Lithuania and Ukraine uh, signed a joint declaration in Vilnius uh, referring to and embracing uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, traditions, this, this composite uh, state um, that existed formally from 1569 until it was finally partitioned in 1795. Um, and also importantly, referring to Belarus um, as a part of this uh, tradition. Uh, so, uh, and then this is an interesting question of the debates within Belarus as well, um, of, of how to view uh, that, that past um, and which uh, historical um, uh, traditions uh, to attach importance to 
uh, as a polity. Um, there is a, a question, I, well, I'm waiting for a question here from one contributor who's ready to say something. Um, in the meantime, uh, Bob, can I, can I ask you to come in? Are there any of these issues that you would like to, uh, to jump in on to, 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 add, it, to add here? Um, there's another question here, um, which is about Miłosz being born out of the Polish Romantic tradition, uh, but opposing the simplified nationalistic twisting of it. Perhaps you could say something about how Miłosz reacted to the kinds of ethnic nationalisms that Thomas uh, was, was uh, just referring to. Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think Miłosz had an extraordinary allergy to ethnic nationalisms and um, uh, uh, you know, as far as, as romanticism goes, uh, Miłosz embodied or, or embraced many different traditions, uh, romantic traditions, and maybe Claire could speak a little more to this. Um, uh, Miłosz is very indebted to Whitman. Um, and, uh, you know, Whitman is, of course, a, a poet of, uh, of, of many voices. Uh, he, he contains, as he says, I contain multitudes. Um, and, and I think Miłosz was uh, inspired by that uh, early, early on, that, that notion of containing multitudes. I think it suited his, his temperament and his experience. Um, so, so that, um, uh, you know, Whitman has a way of being a, a, a national poet while also being uh, uh, encompassing and, 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 in, and, and also a kind of mythic individual as well. Um, so I just, just that. Claire, would you like to add something there on that nationalism question? Thanks, Bob. I just, I'm, I'm following up on what Bob said. I think, I think what you said um, is exactly right. And it also, it, it points to the way, I mean, Whitman's influence in late 19th century, 20th century, European and not just South American, I don't even know where else. I, uh, you know, ubiquitous, enormous influence is how do you make the provincial, which the US was at the time, global? And one of the ways that, that Whitman does it, that I was just thinking about as he talked, is he incorporates all the languages of which that place is made and all the slang and regionalisms and dialect. You know, he has these gorgeous long lists of place names and I, this is just an aside kind of, but it's one thing Miwash taught me as a native Californian and a product, you know, God help me of Californian public schools, but also religious education all the way through. Miwash taught me to re-see Californian history um, precisely as instead of it being, you know, the, the um, air conditioned nightmare or whatever, a bunch of provincialisms and regionalisms and languages that lie buried just beneath the surface and that he's looking for. Again, it's in from the rising of the sun that he he traces back the etymology of the Rogue River, which I knew from camping when I was a kid in Oregon, and what would have been the native name for it, how it got the name Rogue River from the French, the way a plant name is named the Alpine shooting star, you know, what the hell is that? Because there are no Alps, it's Oregon. I mean, what would its name have been in the original language? And he even gets Lithuanian into the mix, um, talking about um, green rue. He segues into it and says, what would it have been in the name? So all this stuff I never thought of that was just, you know, it's normal. Everything has a Spanish name. Why? Because we got California and that's the way it should be. They just left over a bunch of names, you know, but making you go further and dig deep into your own place and recognize the layers of history, the layers of past and the layers of conquest, repression and lost languages, you know? So that's something I think where Whitman was a gift that paid off in a lot of different ways for, for Miwash. Yes. I agree. There's an important comment here that's come in on uh, Lithuania uh, from uh, Edward Lucas, who's very well connected with the Baltic region and, and with Lithuania in particular. And he says Lithuania played a big role in supporting the rebirth of uh, Belarusian um, national identity. 
Um, and, and of course, that is a national identity. That's an idea of national identity that is in some way attached to the, the Grand Duchy uh, of Lithuania, uh, which, which, is the, which occupies the territory or occupied the territory of today's modern Lithuania and Belarus. And it was this composite Lithuanian Slavic uh, entity uh, in a very, very uh, complicated uh, history. Um, and in fact, sometimes there has been a, a kind of tension on, on who is the owner of that legacy, Lithuanians or Belarusians uh, as well. But the Lithuanians are certainly strongly supporting the, um, uh, and probably the most vocal and visible supporters of the Belarusian uh, opposition movement uh, at the moment. Um, Edward then also says that the, on the Polish-Lithuanian question or the question of tensions, that this discussion is a bit out of date now and that things were generally tricky five to 10 years ago, uh, sometimes because of clashes between particular ministers, but this is more or less over now. Um, I can add to that, that I had a discussion with a Polish uh, diplomat only a couple of weeks ago who, who was speaking with great optimism um, about uh, Polish-Lithuanian relations and a kind of new, new opening in those relations with just those few controversial issues that Claire mentioned, for instance, about the uh, the writing, uh, the spelling of names, the spell, spelling of Polish name, whether members of the Polish minority have the right to spell their names in the Polish way or whether they must do so in the Lithuanian way. Um, so just relatively small issue, issues and there's a general sense of confidence about the way those relations are uh, moving. Um, so uh, that's an, an important uh, point to make. That some, but he says sometimes in the Lithuanian worldview, uh, polonization appears as almost as big a curse historically as Russification. Um, Thomas, would you, would you agree with that sense of a sort of symmetry in the Lithuanian viewpoint between uh, an idea of a kind of past Polish colonization or as opposed to a Russian imperialism or how would you respond to that? No, the, this, is, this is very different. Um, well, uh, to go back to the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, um, well, there was the pagan core around Vilnius, which conquered uh, East Slavic lands, which were already Christian, which were all, already Christian and more advanced, which uh, made, which um, later became um, today's Belarus and today's Ukraine. I um, remember I asked one of the Belarusian activists, uh, which part of the country of, of, of the um, Grand Duchy's culture, um, according to you, is Belarusian? He said, 100%. Okay, so, so, um, said I. How about the Lithuanian part? He said, All, also, but 100%. <laughs> so it is uh, completely indivisible. So it is completely, completely indivisible. indivisible. It, the culture of the Grand Duchy developed in Slavic language, in, in Slavic language, in East Slavic language, and uh, somewhat naturally it came to Polish. Uh, Russian influence was different because of the very different religious and historical tradition of Russia. And it, yes, it was much more, um, how to say it, well, much less natural, I would say. And it was unsuccessful. Uh, Lithuania was never really classified, but uh, it was polonized to a degree. And the um, fruit of that polonization is Milos himself. He wrote in Polish. He wrote in Polish that the, well, the same situation as with Yeats or, or Joyce uh, or Shaimus Hini for that matter. They wrote in English, uh, being just yes, being uh, Irish um, writers. It, it's interesting on that point of a kind of competition for the cultural legacy. The figure of Mitskevich is very interesting because well, I've even spoken to Belarusian uh, intellectuals who are uh, very adamant that Mitskevich was a Belarusian uh, poet. Uh, of course, as you said, Thomas, he was born uh, and grew up in, the in a region which is of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which is now uh, Belarus. Um, and uh, of course, there are Lithuanian uh, claims to Mitskevich or, or Mitskevichus uh, in the Lithuanian form as a Lithuanian uh, a poet. 
Uh, so this kind of uh, uh, cultural uh, competition for aspects of the uh, of the legacy of this region. Um, Claire, you look like you want to jump in on this point. Well, this is just very um, brief and anecdotal. When I was in Vilnius um, in 2011 for the, the centenary of, of Miłosz's birth, um, and it was my first time there, and I, I was told in advance, don't use Russian, don't use Polish, stick with English. That's That's the safest way. So I asked the hotel clerk in English if there was a walking tour of places associated with Mitkiewicz. And in English, he kept not understanding me. And then he said, and Thomas, forgive me if I say it wrong. He said, oh, you mean Adamus Mitkiewiczus, you know, <laughs> until I got into Lithuania and he would not tell me where to go. So it, it, even the hotel clerks know. <laughs> I think it is, yes, I think it is uh, um, a bit comic. We, the Lithuanians, came through that um, stage in 1920s, more or less, when we uh, talked about Mitskevichus as a strictly Lithuanian poet by a, by, by a certain um, strange coincidence writing in Polish, although he was Lithuanian by heart. So um, now Belarusians are, are going through the same um, stage. They, they are in the process of obtaining their cultural identity and they are overstating their case. I also asked once a, a Belarusian activist who are the best uh, Belarusian painters. He said Kazimir Malevich and Mark Chagall. So that, that's also a bit comic because Marc Chagall is a French painter of Jewish background and Kazimir Malevich is a Russian painter of Polish background. But they, they happen to live in Belarus, in, yes, in Belarus, in, in Belarus. I think all that is the, simply the case of uh, pains of growing, so to speak, uh, pains of op obtaining the cultural identity and uh, nations and cultures as well as persons are outgrowing this uh, stage and uh, becoming uh, more secure in their uh, cultural identity. And then uh, probably, um, and speaking about Mitskevich, yes, he is also, also indivisible. He belongs to three nations, to Belarusian, Lithuanian, and Polish nation. But uh, his identity, I think, is uh, defined by language he wrote and by his specific patriotism of that period. Thank you very much. We're almost out of time. So I think I, I just want to mention a further comment that Edward Lucas made on Poland and Lithuania, which is that the military cooperation is now extremely close, perhaps the closest of any two countries in the region. If we turn to the geopolitical uh, theme here um, and the worries about the Suwałki gap, um, which is this sort of corridor um, uh, that, that, that links uh, the, the Poland and the uh, Baltic states. Um, so that, that that sort of final section of the NATO alliance um, and that the, this has concentrated minds and brought the two countries together. Um, now, of course, the United States is so, is so important um, in, in all of this, in Lithuania and in Poland, the, the United States uh, um, military alliance and membership of NATO is the foundation of the security of those countries. So just a final short question for, for uh, Bob and then perhaps Claire can jump in. From the United States, how how does how does this region of borderlands that we've gone through this very sort of convoluted uh, conversation on all of the different identities that cross each other and the heterogeneity and the different time periods in which those identities shift and change? Uh, how do Americans? Uh, what do Americans understand of this? What does the United States uh, understand of this of this uh, region? Just a, a few brief final remarks before we finish. Uh, Bob, you'd, uh, could you unmute yourself? Right. Well, let me just add one thing about the heterogeneity. There's also a great deal of, I would call it religious heterogeneity. That, that is, uh, 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 Miłosz was, was fond of pointing out that uh, Lithuania was, was 
late to Christianity uh, among European nations. And, and also that, of course, Vilnius was a great Jewish city. Um, so that's just a, you know, another aspect of this. Um, As Miłosz frequently emphasized. Uh, yes, yes. Um, but I think that, um, uh, you know, I, I don't think I, I, I know what America thinks about <laughs> this, this region. I, I, I think America, it tends to be rather provincial in thinking about this region and, and usually just sees things as, as, as being about Russia um, uh, and, and whatever can, can be, uh, that is Americans tend to be very ignorant of this, th this past. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, what, what, as far as a national policy goes, I don't think I, I, I would know what to say, except that it, it's, uh, fortunes are usually bound up by uh, what Americans, uh, certainly the American government, thinks about what Russia is doing. Thank you. Um, Claire, uh, final, final word uh, to you. About uh, how... Well, they about, the United, about, about America and this region or, or, or where you would like to, uh, whatever you would I, like. I, I guess I'm a bit with Bob. I, I, I kind of hate to say it, but I feel like there's there's kind of willed um, obliviousness even in academic circles. It's been changed by the appearance of someone like Timothy Snyder on the, the global scene who's used his background in this part of the world as a way to talk about problems in rising and falling democracies um, across the globe, including the United States. Um, so he's kind of brought that to the fore, but I think the, the main perception is there's Russia and there's a bunch of stuff around Russia, exactly. even in the academy. Um, this is what I've always felt like is I learned Polish as a quote unquote second Slavic language because you had to learn something besides Russian. It was assumed you would study Russian. Um, and the Russian, imperialism was the foundation of our Cold War politics as it translated into the Soviet era. So there was still a de facto treatment of all these countries as satellite nations. And I think to a certain degree, that's that's remained the case. Um, it's, it's really unfortunate. But even in the academy, as I said, with so much emphasis on colonialism and imperialism and post this and post that, post-Soviet has entered the dialogue, has entered the discussion in the last 15 years or so, but because, for, again, for political reasons, it's, it doesn't fit with what has been a very strong Marxist current in Anglo-American academic thinking. And it immediately assumes you're on the side of the cold warriors, you know, you're Reaganite in disguise. So it hasn't really entered into the dialogue. And in the broader conversation, I don't think America does very well by geopolitics, particularly with smaller nations. We're a nation that, that as Miłosz would have noticed, swallowed up hundreds of hundreds of other little nations and tribes and colonies in the process of creating the inevitability, as we see it, that is the United States. And you don't pay attention. I think that's a, a great conclusion, uh, tying all of this together with uh, the present, <laughs> the, the, the present sort of uh, power that's being challenged, of course. Um, so I want to thank all of the guests who have uh, given us their perspectives so eloquently, um, tying together poetry, geopolitics, history. Um, Thomas Venslova, Claire Kavanagh, and Robert Fagan. Uh, I'm sure that there is virtual applause echoing across, or well, there is real applause echoing, I hope, across uh, rooms in the various places where our audience is present. And I want to really thank our audience members. We had a great turnout. So we, we had around 75 uh, members of the audience and we're still up around 50 um, an hour and a half later. Um, so it's fantastic to, to have uh, so many of you uh, join us for these events, for this event. Uh, and finally, to thank 
um, the, the co-organizers, uh, the Center for Geopolitics at Cambridge, the Lithuanian Cultural Institute, the Lithuanian Embassy in the UK, and the Polish Institute in London, as well as the Institute for Literary, Cultural and Translation Studies at Vilnius University. Thank you very much to all of you, and I wish you a very good evening, and to Bob, a very good day. And thank you, Stan. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, Stan.